Bergen. It's called ASCE. And I will talk about propagation of thermaline anomalies and their predictive potential in the North and North Atlantic. Um, I'm coming from the Nantes Center, and uh, I want to thank the project that has supported uh, the research that I will talk about today. So that's the Blue Action Project and also the uh, Bjerknes Climate Prediction Unit. So I, in this talk, I will uh, focus on the Atlantic water pathway. So that's uh, uh, shown here by these magenta circles. So it follows the major currents from the subpolar region and then towards the Arctic. And I will mention these stations that are shown here uh, several times throughout the talk. Okay, so then just first an uh, outline of this talk. So first I will provide a background and motivation. So I, I will talk about what climate prediction is and about predictability in the ocean. And then a little bit about uh, the time scales that we are focusing in our study. And then I will uh, move towards uh, models, numerical models. So that means the dynamical prediction systems and also tell about how we assess the predictive skill in these, uh, these systems. So then uh, at the second part, I will come to the, to the main study of this talk and uh, where we have analyzed uh, the predictive skill of seven different prediction systems. Um, and we also try to understand why there is lack of skill along this Atlantic water pathway. And we see this quite large difference between north and south of the Green and Scotland Ridge. Uh, and then I will finally come to the, the summary. So then uh, before actually going into what climate prediction is, I just wanted to tell you the highlights of the, or the main message from the study we have done. Um, and this is a study done by uh, many um, people from the Blue Action Project. Uh, and uh, we have been analyzing seven different dynamical prediction systems and looked at their skill in the, along this pathway. And overall they have a low skill uh, along this pathway, and we have seen that this um, seen that they ha also have challenges in in propagating anomalies from the south to the north in this region, and th we think that this is one of the reasons that they are lacking skill in this region. Uh, and then finally, I will say a little bit about how perhaps higher resolution models can can contribute to better skill in this region. And if you wonder what this figure, what this is about, so the subsea mountain here should be the Greenland Scotland Ridge. And uh, the person here, or perhaps this should be a model that has difficulty is in kind of propagating or carrying anomalies from the subtle region and then into the Nordic seas. Okay, so then we, uh, then I will start by telling a little bit about climate prediction, what this is. And before this, I think we will launch our first uh, poll. So then the question is, when we uh, talk about uh, near-term climate prediction, how far ahead in time do we talk about? Is it the next 10 days? Is it the next 10 years or the next 100 years? I should highlight that I mistyped the second option on the poll. So. Uh, the second option down should say 10 years. I noticed that I said the next 100 years twice. So <laughs> apologies on my typing there. The second option should be 10 years, but we'll give a few more seconds for everyone to vote. I hope people figured that out. <laughs> that uh, most have answered the uh, second option, so the next uh, 10 years, and that is um, very right. So that's, that's really great to, great to hear or, or to see the, the result. Uh, so then we continue. Uh, so then you already know that we are, when climate prediction, then we are talking about 10 years ahead. So this is in contrast to 
to what we know as the weather forecast that tries to predict just um, maximum 10 days ahead. And then on the other hand, we have these climate projections that uh, would like to say something about the climate 50 to 100 years ahead. So, so in this way, climate prediction is both an initial value problem because it's dependent on the initial condition, just as a weather forecast. And it's also uh, dependent on the external forcing, such as the um, CO2 level, um, uh, which uh, the climate prediction also are very dependent on. Um, and also you can perhaps see here the weather forecast that we had in, in Bergen in October, which is very typically a lot of rain. Um, so, and why do we work with these climate predictions? So uh, that's because climate prediction can tell us something about the next season or the next year or perhaps the next uh, 10 years. And this is a um, time horizon that is particularly relevant for policymakers. So by knowing what climate we will have in the future or in the near term future, we, this can allow us for long term planning. It could be related to fisheries or to the uh, power industry uh, and, and many other things, perhaps like in uh, tourism. So then, we, um, so then um, people might wonder how we can predict climate on these long um, horizons, like 10 years ahead because we know that our weather forecast only stretches to about uh, 10, maximum 10 days ahead. And the answer is lies in the ocean. The ocean carries the memory of the climate. So if we think about the atmosphere, this has a, it's very chaotic and we could say that it has a memory as a goldfish, whereas the ocean has more a memory like an elephant, a long-term memory. And this long-term memory enables us to predict several years ahead. And a recent study have looked at predictability in, in the North and North Atlantic and also in the Nordic seas. And this study has, uh, has focused on these stations along the major currents like the North Atlantic current, the Nordic seas, uh, sorry, the uh, Norwegian Atlantic current, which is in the Nordic seas. And this, this study have looked at how uh, surface anomalies, temperature and salinity, how they are connected along these stations. And they find that an anomaly in the Fram Strait is, uh, uh, has a significant correlation with all stations uh, uh, upstream. So then, uh, and also they, uh, in other words, we can, we can say that anomalies are then propagating from the south and then towards the Arctic, where there is a time lag. So then the next poll is coming up. And the question is now, how many years does it take on average for a surface anomaly like temperature salinity to then be propagated from the first stations uh, to the station in the, in the from state? So the first stations was, um, and I could show again here, so the first station is down here and then all the way up to the Fram Strait. And the options are now uh, one to three years or sh a short time and then in the middle, 10 to 15 years. And then the last option is more than, more than 20 years. So we'll give everyone just a few more seconds to vote, get your votes in. It is all anonymous, so don't worry, no one's going to get called out for what they voted for. And then I think <clears throat> the results is ready. And I see uh, most of you have answered the middle one, which is the right one. So that's really, really, really nice. Um, and then um, I also want to show this more clearly by showing you here a figure. Um, this is now starting actually here at the third station in the subpolar region. And 
so we focus on these stations and all other stations northwards to the Fram Strait. So what you see here in the Hohmöller diagram is surface uh, temperature. And you see the stations on i-axis and then the time is on the x-axis. And we see that when we have a um, warm anomaly in the north, we also have a warm anomaly in the southward stations. And if there's a cold anomaly in the north, there's also a cold anomaly uh, in the stations further south. And, uh, but also we see that there is a tilt. Uh, so there means there is this time like that you, most of you have answered the, the correct answer, uh, answer to. Uh, at the same time, we also see that this it alternates between cold and warm and that it has repeated, happened repeatedly uh, in the last 50 years. So this shows that there is, is predictability um, in the ocean surface temperature. So if we know what happens in the south, we can predict what will happen further north. And uh, I also want to just mention that this has also been um, suggested by other studies uh, before, which has focused more in the Nordic seas. So, uh, so one study here is the Holiday et al which have looked at these sections along the um, Norwegian Atlantic current, uh, where they also find this kind of time lag in the, in the anomalies. And I also just want to um, highlight here that we have here this two branch system of the Norwegian Atlantic current. And we will see later that this is these two branches is particularly difficult for the coarse climate models. Um, and then I want to say a little bit more about the timescales that we focus on in this, uh, in this talk. So the focus is on multi-year variability. So that means um, what we look at here in the black curves or perhaps the, the red curves. Um, whereas this uh, longer um, timescale, such as the multi-decadal oscillation, which is shown by the shaded uh, color, uh, this is more a slow varying component of the climate. And this is, is not the focus of this talk, but we focus more on these smaller variations, so multi-year variability. So now we come to the numerical models, so the climate models. So um, climate models is, is the basis or what is the, is what these predictions are based on. We start with a climate model and then we use observations um, that uh, are kind of correcting the climate model. So then um, we have these dynamical climate predictions, which is built on the climate models. And in a way they can be um, compared a lot or they have a lot of common in with the weather, uh, weather forecasting models. Uh, that means that the initial or the starting point is essential. We try to do the starting point of the prediction as, as realistic as possible. And then the, the model is uh, freely run. So there are advanced methods to initialize the model. So that means assimilating observation and observations into the model. And also there's large computational power required for these climate predictions because there are many members so these members just means that we change a little bit the initial conditions and then we can see the spread in the members and that will tell us something about uncertainty in the prediction so then i think the next uh, poll is coming up this is a yes no um, so uh, the question is have you been working with dynamical prediction systems. Okay, and then we have the results and it, it seems like a 30% uh, uh, of you have been working with it. So that's, um, that's, uh, really nice to hear and and uh, maybe more of you are interested in looking at these 
predictions. And I will come back later to kind of, uh, or share some links that where you can find more information about these predictions. So then um, I, I mentioned that these observations are used to correct the, um, the prediction because we need a, a starting point of the prediction that are as realistic as possible. So then observation are really an essential ingredient in these climate predictions. And we already now have the second poll of this, uh, uh, sorry, another poll of this talk. And here the question is, which of these observational data sets are typically used to initialize climate prediction? Is it ocean temperature or atmospheric temperature or atmospheric winds? So we'll let a few more seconds roll for these answers to come in. Okay. Thank you all for, for voting here. And uh, I see a uh, majority has answered the first, first one. And this is uh, what is most typically um, used for climate prediction. So that's the ocean temperature. And also, um, so, so I could say that in the first climate prediction, only surface temperature was, uh, was used to initialize the model, but now also the predictions or the prediction systems are using a hydrographic profile. So they also add information at the, at the subsurface depth. Okay, so then, so how then do we assess or now know how good these climate predictions are? How can we assess them? And uh, what we usually do is that um, we uh, make this hindcast. That means we are predicting the past. So, for instance, we are making predictions for the period 1950 and up to now, and then we look at how well these predictions are are matching the actual observations. So then I will show you just an example here of how we, how we, how we can look at this. And so this is now showing you, uh, oh, sorry, um, showing you observations in the black curve. So that's the sea surface temperature in this box in the Nordic seas. And then on top of this, we have the predictions so then we uh, in green color and you see where they are initialized. That's where you have this magenta circles. So that's where they are, uh, um, where we assimilate observations into the system. And then, then the prediction runs freely here. And the gray color or the spread you see is this ensemble spread. So the uncertainty in the prediction. And, and this is from the couple model model in the comparison project uh, five, the fifth phase. And this was the first time climate prediction were part of this couple model in the comparison. And then we had start dates every fifth year for these predictions. And now in the um, sixth phase of the couple model in the comparison project, uh, these predictions are starting actually every year. So now we have much more data and we can make much more robust statistics uh, on this prediction and the predictive skill of the predictions. And uh, I, uh, if you want to have more information about these um, predictions, I, um, I think Hannah will can share a link with you in the chat, in the chat uh, which is about, uh, gives you more an overview of these decadal climate predictions. So then, then I'm now coming to the to the study. So the wind study I want to talk about in this talk, um, and this is uh, a work done together with uh, several um, uh, people in the Blue Action Project, and we have together looked at uh, seven different dynamical prediction systems, and we focus on skill along this this pathway here, and 
um, as mentioned, we see overall that there is low skill in this region on multi-year time scale. And uh, um, we have then looked further to kind of understand why there's lack of skill. We have looked at this, um, this co-variability uh, that was, so this mechanism that was identified in observation, where we see that anomalies are propagating from south to north. With south to north, we have also looked at this in the in the different um, in the mod models used here. And then at at the end, I would just say a little bit about the surface velocities in these different uh, these models. And I also just want to briefly mention a little bit about the. The prediction system used. So here you see the name of the seven prediction systems. Uh, in the second column, we see the horizontal resolution and then the vertical resolution. And these are typically coarse, um, so global climate models, uh, typically a one degree by one degree resolution in the horizontal. And here in this third column, you see how many members there is for each of the starting dates and then there are in the rest of the table there are some more details about how the different uh, uh, systems are initialized with observations so <clears throat> uh, again saying a little bit about this time scale so uh, if we now take sst uh, in this box so the eastern subpolar region we get this uh, this gray curve here what we see in the background. Uh, so first, before looking at or analyzing the predictive skill, we are re removing this longer time scale variability. That means this, uh, for instance, this Atlantic multi-decade variability. So that's represented by this blue curve. This is removed from all of the time series that we analyze. So then we are left with this red curve, which is more focused around multi-year variability. So then. Um, what we will look at in the next slide is how well are these prediction systems capturing the variability that we see here in the red curve. So <clears throat> when we look at predictive skill, so the correlation between uh, the prediction and the actual observation, then we have here uh, looked at three different regions, the eastern subpolar region, and then the region that is on the ridge, and then the part of the Norwegian Sea. So I will here first show um, the predictive skill in the eastern subpolar region. And what we see here in the red curve is the multimodal mean of all the seven uh, prediction systems. You see the correlation on the i-axis, so that's a measure of the predictive skill. And then on the x-axis we have this forecast time, so that means how far we are away from when the uh, prediction was initialized. So at the <clears throat> year one, we are very close to when we initialize. So we were in year one after initialization. And then here at year two, we are two in year two after we initialize the model. So we can see that in the beginning, short time after we initialize with observations, then we see that the skill uh, of predicting sea surface temperature is, is good. And it's still at lead time two, it, we have significant skill, but then it drops down at higher forecast times. And then if we go to the, uh, the Norwegian sea, we see again that initially we have a good skill, but then it drops even more dramatically for higher lead times. So then we <clears throat> want to try to, or we try to understand why we have this low skill, and then we come back to this um, this um, mechanism that was identified in observation, where we have these anomalies that propagate from south to north, and and one way to to look at this is to do this cross correlation. So we um, this is now showing data from Hadley SST two. And then we use a time series uh, in the from straight, the SST time series, and correlate with all other stations upstream. 
So then you here you see the stations on the x-axis and then the time like here. And we see that the from straight has a positive correlation with all stations upstream. And we also have this time lag um, here on the x-axis. So then I think we now come to the another poll. So we have seen this SST pattern, like this one, this cross correlation for head SST. And uh, then the question is now, what do you think we will see when we look at the SST pattern in the predictions? Um, do you think that the prediction shows a realistic pattern? So the similar kind of SST pattern as the head SST data, where will we see um, a similar pattern, but with a different time lag? Or uh, will the prediction shows no correlation? We'll give everyone just a few more seconds, get your votes in. Okay, that's great then. We have the results ready and the uh, majority have uh, chosen the, 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 the second one, that there is a different time lag in the predictions. Uh, and some have also chosen the other ones. and and. Um, and, and actually, all of these can be a correct answer. It depends on the model we look at. Uh, but uh, for most of them, the B is right, that we see this kind of different time lag. So I will now show you the result from the prediction. So here is, again, the Headless ST2 data, um, so observation-based. Then we see three different, uh, so examples of three of the systems are shown here. So one system is shown here. So then you, for all of them, you see that the, we have this positive correlation among the stations, uh, but we have this different time lag as, as most of you suggest to. So for instance, this one shows a quite large time lag. For this one, we have a short time lag. And, and this is a, a little bit more difficult to interpret because the uh, correlation are, are, are lower. Um, so, um, so the difference uh, that we see here between the, the predictions and the observation-based data, this can be due to both that the initialization could be poor, so how we assimilate observation into the system, or it can also be due to that the model physics are uh, not good enough to represent this propagation uh, from south to north. So to look in this uh, more into detail, we have, um, we have uh, looked into the historical simulations of these prediction systems. So the historical systems, uh, sorry, the historical runs uh, are, do not use any uh, type of initialization. So there are no observations assimilated into the system. So then it will purely show you the model physics. So now coming to the next slide here, we um, uh, this is a little bit uh, messy. So I'll try to explain you uh, step by step. So if we first look now at the, um, at the curves, so this is the results from the predictions. So we are correlating the pattern from the observation based with uh, the pattern from the predictions. And uh, this pattern correlation, or uh, this correlation is, is shown here on the x-axis. And then we see how it changes with the forecast time. And then we see there, are quite, there is a quite large spread in how this pattern is seen in the predictions. But then when we look into the historical run, so without any uh, use of any observations, then, then we get a result that we see in these horizontal lines that are in the in the background here, and then we also see there there is a quite large spread in the correlation, so meaning that <clears throat> it's uh, difficult for the models uh, to to represent this 
propagation of anomalies from the south to the north. Um, and regarding this industrialization, whether this is a good or, or not, uh, we have looked at this by um, looking at the prediction at the very um, at the time when they are initialized. And, and here we see that these have a, a good score, meaning that the in, is initialization at surface is good, uh, but the model physics makes it difficult to reproduce this SST, SST pattern. So then, <clears throat> so this, so since this looks or suggests that it, it's related to the model physics, uh, we have also looked into the surface velocities of the models uh, to see if this, if there can be, or how the models are differing to each other. So now we see, look again at these stations, and you see the surface currents for two of the of the models here. And <clears throat> if we take the mean velocity for the stations, uh, we see here now the result from the different models. So we see that there's a quite large spread in the strength of the velocity along the stations or along the, this Atlantic water pathway. So um, this more yellowish model has, has um, <clears throat> weak velocities where we see quite strong velocities in the, this model here. And if we now come back to this propagation or this SST pattern, we see that there is a larger time lag in in this model with with low velocities, and then there is a short uh, time lag in the one with uh, or, sorry there is a short time lag in the ones with which has higher velocities. So uh, this could suggest that there is a link between the propagation, how fast anomalies are propagated to the north, and then the the velocity in the models. And, and and another study is also pointing to that it's something with the model physics that makes it difficult to um, predict changes in the Nordic seas. And that is a study that has looked much more in detail uh, in the Norwegian climate prediction model. So in this, this study, uh, the focus is on the subpolar North Atlantic in this box and then compared with the Norwegian Sea. So then, uh, uh, then it, we focus on one um, system and uh, the differences between what you see here is different versions of the Norwegian climate uh, prediction model. So it means that the prediction has been initialized in different ways. So it's, we do not change the model physics. Uh, so what we see here, so I should say that the black curve shows you the predictive skill for the, the subpolar North Atlantic, and the red curve shows you the Norwegian Sea. And this first uh, panel is at short lead time, so one to three years ahead. And then you have the medium uh, lead time, so forecast times here, and then a longer forecast time here. And what we see is that uh, Kind of regardless of what type of initialization is used, what kind, how, so how observation are um, simulated into the system. So reg regardless of this, we see that the the Norwegian Sea has always this lower skill compared to the circle on North Atlantic. Um, <clears throat> and and there is particularly one one. Um, at, uh, one version has, has a, a large negative correlation uh, in the Norwegian Sea. And we have looked at this in a bit more detail by looking at these geographical maps. So this is now at this long forecast time for the Norwegian climate prediction model. And <clears throat> we see that uh, as we have seen, the subpolar North Atlantic has relatively high skill, but as we come to the to the Nordic seas, we see that there is this um, large region with negative correlation. So this is in the Norwegian basin. Whereas if we follow the, the very 
eastern rim of the Norwegian Sea, we see that we have have steris skill. Um, so this could point to that there is um, difficulty in this kind of two branch system because we know that the Norwegian Atlantic Current has two branches going north. Uh, so the inner branch shows good skill, whereas the outer branch, uh, which is this kind of frontal zone between Arctic and Atlantic water, this is much more difficult to to represent in the in the climate model. Um, <clears throat> so then, uh, perhaps higher resolution can help to give better represent representation of what what is happening in this in this region. So another study is then focused on, not on predictions but on the um, on the climate model. So without any uh, insulation, but it's it's uh, the Norwegian Earth System model that has been forced by a realistic atmosphere. So here we are comparing two different versions, uh, a version with one degree, so like the typical, what is typically used for the climate predictions. And there is another one with a quarter degree resolution, which is uh, about 25 kilometers in the horizontal. And <clears throat> so, so, so what do we expect when we have a high resolution? Uh, so we know that the bathymetry is varying quite a lot uh, along the Atlantic water pathway. Uh, we have this shallow uh, ridge, the Greenland Scotland ridge, and it's uh, it's it's quite complex this bathymetry. And we also know that the flow of Atlantic water partly follows the bathymetry. So if we resolve better the bathymetry, also um, we um, this could potentially lead to a better representation of the of the surface circulation, and we have seen that the the, tr the heat transport and mass transport across the ridge is improved, and when we look to the velocities, we also see improvements. So this is now the the left hand panel shows you what we get from a one degree by one degree. Uh, so this is what was used for the climate predictions, and we see that the currents are quite broad, diffusive, and and especially this North Atlantic current is quite difficult to represent. And we, we also don't see this two branch system in the Nordic seas. So then moving to the quarter degree, we see much more kind of narrower um, currents, more sharper. We also can see that we have this uh, two branch system in the Nordic seas. So then I think we are at the last uh, the poll. And then the question is, do you think that the this SST pattern, so that means this cross correlation that we are looked at, will this uh, be improved when we look at higher resolution, um, this um, <clears throat> quarter degree com compared to one degree by one degree? Then we have the results, and we see that um, most of you have said yes. That's uh, that was also what we believed when we started the study. And uh, what we see, I will show you now the results from the study is that so we first on the upper panel we have the observation de based data, um, and we again see this cross correlation with positive correlations, and on the lower panels, we have the one degree uh, by one degree model here, and then the high resolution quarter degree on the right hand side. Right hand side. Uh, and we see that both of them have this positive correlation, but uh, the time lag is different uh, in the high resolution. When, the t and when there is this dif different time lag, it means that the anomalies will enter the station at different times, uh, which is important for when we are predicting uh, anomalies. Uh, it's a, uh, we thought it was a little bit difficult to compare because we know that Hadley's ST is a, a product that is one degree by one degree, so similar to this 
um, the coarsest resolution, whereas this quarter degree, this um, has a finer uh, results on a finer scale. Um, but when we are looked at salinity, in addition, uh, especially especially subsurface salinity, we see that the timing in this high resolution is uh, similar to what we see when we look at uh, salinity at subsurface. And then coming to the last slide, so I just wanted to bring up again the, <clears throat> the main uh, results uh, from the, this study. So we see that when we look at multi-year time scale, we see that it's overall low skill um, beyond one to two years forecast time in this region. And we see also that it's challenging for the climate models to represent this uh, mechanism that has been identified in observation, this mechanism where we proper anomalies are propagate to the north. And at the same time, we think that it's, we believe that higher skill will improve um, the models. So improve the surface velocities and thereby can also improve the predictions. And then I would say thank you all for listening. And uh, if there is any questions or you want to contact me afterwards, here is my uh, email. And also if you find it, um, find this interesting, you can find also more interesting research at this uh, blue action um, that uh, this project has, which has reported this uh, study. So then thanks again. Great, thank you so much, Helen, uh, for that really interesting talk. There were so many different graphs going on. That was a lot, <laughs> a lot of simulations and models that you have been doing. Um, so for anyone who wants to find out more about uh, Blue Action, there is a link right now in the chat uh, that you can click. Uh, I also did include a link uh, that uh, Helen had provided me, uh, which was sent earlier, but I'll just copy that again in case anyone who's joined us now is unable to uh, see that. And also there was a link to a podcast. Helen, what was that podcast about? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that in the talk. So, <laughs> so that was just if you were curious about climate prediction and the difference with climate prediction, uh, we have made a podcast with the, within the Bergman Center that you can hear more about the differences uh, between prediction and projection. Oh, excellent. And just to check, that's in English, isn't it? That's in English, yes. Oh, okay, yes. that's good. <laughs> Uh, we may have some Norwegians with us right now on the call, but I, I can't think, I don't think we all, uh, most of our audience can speak that language. So good to check. Yeah. Right, we have got one question in the Q&A right now. So if any of our attendees who are with us have a question for Helen, please do type it in right now. We will ask that question. But of course, if you want to pick up a more direct conversation with Helen, please note down her email. It is on the screen right now. And if you want to recap anything that was discussed in this webinar, then uh, just check out the recording of this talk that will be available on the MAST YouTube channel later today. It will include this Q&A part as well and you'll be able to recap anything or share it with someone else. So I'm gonna go straight on to the question that we have in the Q&A. Uh, and this related to, um, this came in when you were showing that uh, table with lots of different models that you, you, you have involved and uh, it's from Alejandro and they ask, so your ensemble members are parameter uh, perturbations, not totally different models. Is that correct? Um, yes, so, um, so, so we have used the different models and, and for each of the models, when we make this ensemble spread, we are changing this initial conditions. So, so we have different models and for each of the models we change these initial conditions to make this spread, uh, ensemble spread to look at uncertainty. I'm okay. not sure if I answer this in a good way but... Uh, <laughs> Alejandro yeah. if you, uh, you uh, want to expand on your question uh, then please feel free to type it in the Q&A box but hopefully that answered your question. We've got another one from Leon. Uh, they are asking, are you considering looking at decadal prediction system that uses a high resolution ocean, such as one at the Met Office? Yes, that's, that's a really good idea. Uh, yes, uh, that, uh, that is uh, something that we would like to do. 
and uh, we there is work on uh, also on a high resolution um, to make a high resolution version of the this Norwegian climate prediction model, and uh, and also now I see that there is one from the Met Office, so that would be that would be really interesting to look at if we see this improved skill with higher resolution. Excellent. Um, so I personally don't have any questions because that was a, a topic that I am not familiar with at all, but it was really interesting. So I guess I would really like just to know the work packages that you're involved in in Blue Action, what are they about? What, what's your involvement with Blue Action? That would be really nice. Because yes, I know so, there's a variety of things going on with that because uh, it's a cross EU project. Yes, it's uh, so the Blue Action is a big project and I've been working mostly in work package four and this has been about uh, these dynamical climate prediction uh, systems and to enhance their skill. Uh, there is so there has been a lot of work to analyze their skill and also uh, work to kind of improve the predictions by adding more observations. So I mentioned about that um, we had we use ocean observations to include in the system and also some of the systems now also include sea ice to further improve skill and and especially uh, sea ice can improve the skill if we focus more on the arctic region um, so yeah so it, i think it, the work package name is about enhancing skill in the north atlantic arctic region that's the main main focus Mm -hmm. And uh, what have you got coming up with the project? Because I know it's a very active project. There's a lot of uh, things that are happening within it. Have you got anything in the future that we can keep an eye out for? Uh, yeah, so actually this project is now going uh, towards uh, its ending phase. So it will end in the September and uh, about around September. And then uh, it's actually good that you bring this up because there will uh, actually be this um, workshop uh, happening in September where many of the blue action people will join and uh, and also from other pro uh, related projects so i um, i'm not sure but i think i might have sent a link for this workshop yes I, I did pop it in the chat so uh, if anyone has the chat open i think uh what helen is referring to is the predictability workshop yes yeah so please so. have a look there and i and uh, i think the deadline for um, adding abstracts if you would be interested in that is on on friday so yeah in two days <laughs> yeah so uh, if anyone's interested then please click that link and check out the information for the abstract submission on the 11th of june the workshop date is the 20th to the 22nd of september um which is happening online uh but possibility of a hybrid so uh, it's pretty much open to anyone if it's if it's online so that's really great to hear yes. excellent so um, we don't have any more questions to work through right now. So um, as we have a couple of minutes to spare, I'm just wondering, Helen, is there anything else you would like to share uh, with our audience right now about the work that you do or um, anything that you would just like to say? I'll, I'll give the floor to you for a moment if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. I, I actually think I've said uh, plenty of Think so we probably be full of input so I just want to say thanks again for joining and thanks for letting me give a talk here at MOST that was a really nice uh, experience. Great and uh, thank you for being today's MOST webinar presenter and um, if anyone wants to have that conversation with Helen directly uh, her email was on the previous slides just now and you'll be able to find that in the recording. Uh, Helen maybe you can just pop it in the chat as well just for anyone who uh, is interested in sending you an email. Yeah. Great. OK, so um, that leaves me just to say um, what next week's talk is. So next week's talk is actually a rescheduled talk that we weren't able to bring to you um, in May uh, just because of a few technical issues that happened uh, for Douglas Spears. But if this was a talk you signed up for and you would still like to join us, then it is next week at the same time. You'll be able to find a, join, um, a registration link on the MAST website or just check out the registration page that you used to join this very webinar. And these are the last two talks for June. So um, if Doug, Spear, uh, Doug Spears talk isn't for you, but one of these is, make sure you check out the exact same pages that I've already mentioned. So the MAST website and the Zoom webinar registration page, you'll be able to find the sign up link right there. Uh, I really do hope that you can join us again for another MAST webinar. Um, and that's everything. So uh, check out the recording if there's anything that you want to recap on the MAST YouTube channel later today. 
Thank you.